Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about something called disproportionate collapse and why it's really important that you design for it early on in your structure. This is something which can be overlooked by young engineers who don't really know enough about it or have basically never even heard of it. I hadn't heard of disproportionate collapse until about a year in when I first joined Hydrock and it was in like the first project I ever went into when I joined the firm and it was in a design team meeting. In the meeting we were discussing if the building should be classed as 2A or 2B because it has a quite significant impact on the structural detailing and at the time I had no idea what was really going on and I was just letting my manager do all the talking and I was just basically nodding and listening in. But what I made sure I did was write down in my notebook what disproportionate collapse is so that I went back and researched it. Disproportionate collapse is something which you need to identify quite early on in a project because if you identify it too late or the class changes because you didn't really know or look into it properly, it can be quite problematic to change later on in the project. Disproportionate collapse is the design of the structures so that in the event of something failing, it doesn't cause progressive collapse. So what that means is, simplistically, is say that you've got a 10 storey building and something happens on the eighth floor. What you don't want to happen is for the collapse of something on that 8th floor to cause the floors above it and the floors below it to collapse with it. If it's going to collapse, you just want it to collapse on the 8th floor. So essentially, the collapse of one thing doesn't cause the collapse of further things. So an infamous incident is called Ronan Point, and I think this was a building in the sort of 1960s. And essentially what happened was there was a gas explosion up at one of the higher floors, and that basically caused the entire corner of that building to collapse. So essentially the gas explosion caused something to collapse on that floor and because it wasn't properly detailed or designed for progressive collapse because it really wasn't known at the time, it caused all the floors above and below to collapse with it. This triggers structure engineers to really think about progressive collapse and that's how the sort of design and detailing of disproportionate collapse came about. Disproportionate collapse is a robustness criteria and it's something which you do in this sort of detail and design of the building I'll get onto this um, later on in the video. Disproportionate collapse is categorised into four different classes. This is specific to the UK and I'm not entirely sure if it's done in a similar way in different countries, so just be aware that it might be slightly different to what I'm about to explain. If you have the red pocket book, there's a few pages on disproportionate collapse in there, so feel free to go and have a look there. A building is classified differently based on the type of the building and also the height of the building. So a residential building which is 20 storeys high is going to be different to an educational building which is 2 storeys high. Disproportionate collapse is dealt with slightly differently depending on the construction material used. I'll explain this as I go through, but you need to know how the detailing is done per material. So class 1 structures don't have any special time requirements or detailing rules to cater for disproportionate collapse. Most houses that don't exceed four storeys are going to be classified as class one. Other buildings such as agricultural buildings or buildings which are very rarely used can also be classed as class one. So moving on to class 2A, and essentially class 2A buildings need to have horizontal ties or the floor needs to be effectively anchored to the wall. In steel and concrete frame buildings, it's quite an easy requirement to meet. All you have to do is to make sure that the column to beam connection can resist a certain tie force which you will need to separately calculate. In a timber frame building or timber walled building, you have to make sure that the sort of joists are effectively anchored or tied to the walls and this is normally done by special bolts or special screws or using straps. Commonly in residential buildings not exceeding four storeys, these will be classed as 2A and it's very common that you'll be using like load bearing masonry with like a precast plank as the floors. And instead of needing to strap or screw the planks into the walls, all you have to do is to make sure that the precast planks have enough bearing on the right edges. Examples of a class 2A building is going to be something like residential buildings not exceeding four storeys or educational buildings not exceeding one storey. So the difference between class 2B and class 2A is that you have to provide vertical ties as well as horizontal ties. Again, in steel and concrete, this is very, very easy to do. And in concrete frame, all you have to do is make sure that the reinforcement can resist that tie force as well. Where things start to get a little bit tricky in detailing is in like load bearing timber or load bearing masonry buildings. 
in timber structures, it's generally a bit easier to go down the separate routes, which could be key element design or the notional removal of elements. I'll explain these later on in the video. In no bearing masonry, you can provide vertical ties by providing reinforcement through hollow block masonry units. The only problem with doing this is that it can be an absolute pain to build on site, so it actually might be easier to go down the key element or the notional element removal methods. This is why it's good to get a contractor's early opinion to see which route they want to go down as well. Buildings which are classified as class 2B are going to be something like residential buildings ranging from 5 to 15 storeys or educational buildings ranging from 2 to 15 storeys. So the final class is class 3 and essentially class 3 is everything you need to do with class 2B but you have to do a, an additional risk assessment and you have to factor in stuff like debris. If something falls down there's going to be extra debris load. How is that going to affect the collapse of the building? So basically any building which exceeds the range which I stated in 2B, so residential buildings over 16 storeys or hospitals say over I think it's 4 storeys would be classed as class 3. So I mentioned two other methods which you can use if you can't use the sort of tiring requirements I stated earlier and that is key element design and the notional removal of an element. So just to briefly explain the notional removal element method it's essentially imagining removing a wall or a column and seeing what effect that has on the overall structure. This can be quite a time consuming and tricky method to use and sometimes it's easier to go down the tying method or the key element route. So what is key element design? Key element design is essentially designing an element or elements for accidental loading. And this accidental force like the gas explosion in Ronin Point is say designing a column for the gas explosion load. Another example is designing columns or walls for a car impact load. Say for example you've got a car park which is formed using concrete frame, transfer slab above and then you've got say five stories of masonry building above. So basically you need to design the column for withstanding an impact load from a vehicle. By designing the column for this impact load you're essentially designing this sort of transfer slab basement area for disproportionate collapse as you'll be preventing any progressive collapse if say a vehicle hit a column but you'll also need to check the stories above separately for disproportionate collapse but that doesn't necessarily mean you need to design it for a key element you could just go back to the time requirements I mentioned earlier. I highly recommend reading the iStructy guidance document on disproportionate collapse I still use it all the time when I'm referring back to disproportionate collapse and looking at sort of standard details and how to design key elements. It's a really, really useful reference document, which I highly recommend. I mentioned earlier in concrete frame and steel frame buildings that you need to calculate a certain tie force. I'll do a separate video on this where I go through an example on how to calculate this tie force. So remember to like and subscribe and smash that notification bell to get notified for when I do upload that video. Anyways, hopefully you found this video useful and I'll catch you on the next video. Cheers.